A is microbial source tracking. I'll start by giving a brief introduction to what that is. And then I'm going to go into some steps for designing an MST study and talk about some study approaches for doing that. Um, most of the time will be spent on reviewing microbial source tracking methods because this is where things get a little um, challenging is deciding what methods to use. I'm also going to um, mention some, some of the commonly used methods, talk about some new methods, and then data interpretation, which is really important and um, troublesome sometimes. I'm going to end with some recommendations. Oh, um, we're currently using fecal indicator bacteria, such as tocoliforms, fecal coliforms, E. coli, and enterococci to monitor water bodies for fecal pollution. Uh, the problem is uh, these are great indicators. Um, they're easy to measure, uh, but they really tell us about the source of um, the fecal contamination to water bodies. And down below, uh, I'm showing the uh, IDEX color test. Let's see if I can get lighter here. Um, IDEX color alert test, which is used to measure uh, total coliforms and fecal coliforms, including E. coli. The um, enter alert test for enterococci, and um, this is an MTEC plate that's showing total coliform bacteria. And all three of these methods are culture based. So um, that's essentially why we need microbial source tracking methods. Uh, these are tools that are used to find out where the fecal bacteria are coming from and also to identify dominant sources of fecal contamination. Um, they're becoming more widely used to develop TMDL programs, and th this is required by the uh, Clean Water Act. Uh, to determine the uh, pollute loading capacity of water bodies and to identify the dominant sources of fecal pollution in order to uh, mitigate the, the problem and to uh, reduce the bacterial levels or chemical pollutants, if that's the case. So, um, just to go over the sources of fecal pollution, there's basically two groups. There's point sources, and these are the sources that are um, usually structural. They're easy to identify. Um, they include things like uh, sewage outfall pipes. And then there's non-point source, and this is really where um, microbial source tracking um, becomes useful because these sources are more diffuse, and they include things like runoff, um, and then you have animals and birds. Okay, now we'll talk about steps to designing a microbial source tracking study. First thing um, you should really is to consult with a panel of experts, and these include um, microbiologists, Molecular biologists, engineers, chemists, consultants, um, perhaps a statistician, and um, you know, people wonder, you know, what's the difference between a microbiologist and molecular biologist? Microbiologists have a more uh, broad uh, expertise in the area of microbiology. They are um, experts at cultivating, growing bacteria. They um, know about the ecology, um, how uh, organisms are transmitted to humans, and the types of diseases they cause, uh, where organisms reside in the body as well as in the environment. Um, other biologists, on the other hand, are um, specialized at looking at the genetic traits of organisms. So they're really good at it extracting the DNA from organisms and splicing and dicing them with enzymes and then 
identifying them using um, uh, genetic or molecular techniques, whereas microbiologists are more familiar with identifying organisms based on uh, culture techniques. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail here. So then after you've got your uh, study team together, the first thing you're going to want to do is to do some data mining. As looking at the historical fecal indicator bacteria monitoring results, um, you're going to want to look at um, trends in the indicator levels, and you're going to want to uh, look to see if there's any patterns or correlations with the FIU levels with say, spatial and temporal patterns. Um, there's a seasonal effect. Maybe there's a relationship with um, high levels with the time conditions. And specifically, uh, I mean, um, you know, are you seeing more high counts during low versus high tides? Um, are you getting a higher frequency of exceedances during spring versus deep tides? And for those of you who don't know um, what spring tides are, they have nothing to do with the spring, of course. Um, this is when, because of the uh, combined gravitational pull from the sun and the moon, uh, high tides are higher and low tides are lower. And so what typically happens during spring tide events, um, and this is when we have a full and um, new moon, is that we get uh, not only these extreme tides, but we get a higher volume of water flowing inland. And so we may have transport of uh, uh, pollutants like bacteria that are entrained in sediments, uh, respended, and then transported into water bodies. So the conditions are important. Um, the other thing um, you'll want to correlate levels with is runoff flows. Uh, for example, you may have a uh, Creek flowing into an ocean, which is typical in, in California. And you may, you may see higher exceedances when the uh, creek is not bermed and is flowing directly into the ocean versus when it's bermed, which is um, basically a wall of sand that's formed by tuction. Um, the other thing you're going to want to look at is how the exceedances correlate with bird densities. Um, we know that in certain parts of California, birds are really an issue. Um, I, I want Creek. We saw a higher density of birds um, from about October through April, and so um, I want to correlate, you know, the bacteria levels with uh, bird densities. Um, then one of the most important things um, to do up front in designing a study is to define your study question and um, decide on what the desired outcomes should be. The first example that I want to talk about is where you have a high frequency of intercoxy exceedances at the beach. And so in this case, your study question will be what are the the sources of intercoxy exceedances. So you're looking specifically at intercoxy versus total and fecal coliforms. And your desired outcome, is, of course, is to do source mitigation that reduces or eliminates the exceedances. Another type of study um, may be focused on um, urban runoff. Um, the monitoring results may indicate that the storm drain is a primary source of bacteria to a beach or, you know, enclosed water body. So then the question would be, what are the primary sources of fecal bacteria to storm off? Um, and another question which people don't generally think about, about you know, high levels in the storm rain, right? is it due to bacterial regrowth? I mean, or is it all coming from fecal sources? So that would be another 
um, issue you want to address in your study. And the desired outcome in this case, of course, would be source mitigation that reduces the indicator uh, period loading. On the right hand side is a photo of um, a storm scepter that's being installed, and um, this is actually being uh, done more widely now. We know that these storm scepters are great at, at removing oils and chemical pollutants, uh, sediments. We really don't know how efficient they are for uh, uh, removing bacteria. Um, but since you have bacteria that are attached to sediments, um, you know, they may be helpful. It's still something that hasn't really been looked at in uh, great detail. Okay, um, another thing you'll want to do is to use your available data. Um, and this can be in the form of sanitary surveys. I, you know, would start by looking at uh, some of the watershed characteristics, such as the size, um, you know, happening in the watershed in terms of land use, where are the rivers and creeks, um, what the uh, population density is mainly residential versus industrial uh, use. Um, what type of animals do you have in watershed? And then you want to focus on what's happening upstream, say so uh, your discharge point. Um, is there a wastewater treatment plant upstream? And is it discharging effluent into the creeks? Uh, what about homeless populations? they could be contributing uh, fecal waste to your watershed. And these are important characteristics because the complexity of the watershed is going to determine what methods that you select. And you'll see why a little bit later there will be a difference, um, say, in uh, small watersheds versus large watersheds and the com complexities therein. Another thing that you'll want to do, this is really important to review previous studies. And this is because the field is constantly changing. Um, it's down for about 10 years. And I think when we first started with doing um, source tracking work, you know, we were very optimistic and we thought that, you know, using one or two methods would give us the answers and tell us what specific Forces were causing the pollution. But, you know, we've learned a lot in the last 10 years, and especially in the last two years, as you'll hear about later. So, methods in particular are constantly improving with, um, you know, improved technologies and with more widespread use. So, it's important to consult the literature frequently. Uh, I've also provided some references at the end. And uh, we'll go over those later. So now let's talk about um, study approach. Uh, most people have found in doing these source tracking studies is that using a tiered adapted approach works best. So you want to do your study in phases. Maybe during phase one, you'll want to do a, you know, extensive survey and monitor the entire watershed. Or maybe you don't have to start there, and you can focus on areas of concern because you've been doing um, routine monitoring throughout your watershed. So it really depends on how much information you have. You may not know exactly what's happening upstream, or you know, if there is a source upstream, um, you may want to do some um, sampling in between the source and the discharge point. So then, um, phase two would be doing more intensified studies in your area of concern that was be identified during phase one. Um, and then with the adapted approach, I mean the step has to be uh, flexible. Um, based on your preliminary data, you may want to refine the study. So you know, you've got to be uh, open 
to the fact that, you know, maybe the study won't go exactly as planned. It may change. And you're also going to need to determine the length of the study period. Um, some studies are done for just a single season or year. Um, you know, the more years that you can do a study, um, the more reliable your, your information. There's some disadvantages to doing short-term studies. Um, and that's because, as you know, conditions change. For example, you may have an El Nino year where you've get, got a lot of rainfall. And so, yeah, you're going to see, you know, um, higher frequency of exceedances. But um, this could change in, in the following year where, um, you know, you've got more of a drought condition and less urban runoff flows. So the main disadvantage, I would say, to doing short-term studies short-term studies is that, um, you know, you're going to have a higher risk for undersampling. And what you find uh, one year or season may not be applic applicable to the next year. Okay, so more on the tiered approach. The first thing I would do is to um, investigate the obvious sources of fecal pollution, and th these include things like the animal lots, um, you know, if you've got a, a um, developed area, what are the disposal and clean practices of restaurants and maybe some other businesses in the area. Um, you'll want to look at lawn grass disposal. And I know this doesn't seem like a big deal, but it actually can be, um, especially uh, from golf courses, because I've actually measured the uh, enterococci levels in grass, and per gram weight of grass, the numbers of enterococci can be similar to what you would find per gram of fecal waste, and so um, that's important. Um, then you have, of course, um, failing septic systems. Those would be, an, you know, other obvious sources. And then after addressing those, I would focus on the more diffuse sources, like runoff. And, of course, this includes some runoff, irrigation runoff, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, maybe uh, golf courses and nurseries are things that people don't look at, but the runoff from these areas could, you know, potentially be contributing high uh, amounts of nitrates and phosphates that bacteria love and thrive on. Okay, then you need to decide on your desired level of source discrimination. Um, and this depends too on, you know, how much money you have to do the study. Um, you may be limited to just uh, discriminating at a very broad level uh, of sources, and that means human or non-human, and the picture on the left uh, is a photo of my two teenage sons, and so if you've got teenagers, then you know they fall, they fall into the non-human category. Um, or you might want to get more specific and determine um, specific sources, such as is it the seagulls or is it the domestic animals or cattle or swine? And these are my grandkids, by the way. Um, these bugs over here um, represent other sources. Um, so there are many sources that people don't think of, such as um, rodents, for instance. Um, in Southern California, um, we know that paramiscus, which is uh, field mice, field mouse, are actually the most predominant mammal most watersheds. So there may be hosts that, that you're not looking at. Um, but in any case, you need to decide on what is going to be your uh, love source discrimination. Is it going to be broad or is it going to be specific? And this is important for selecting which methods and tools that you're going to be using. Okay, so now we'll go on to method section. And this is where things get a little gene. Uh, what I did is I put together this uh, kind of a flow chart because, you know, I'm sure you've heard of terms like 
phenotypic, genotypic, and very dependent, independent methods. And so you may be confused as to you know, what does this all mean? How does it apply in terms of which method I'm going to be using? So here at the top, you know, we've got um, the two basic groups of MST methods, and these are phenotypic, which is genotypic, and I'll explain what those mean in a minute. And under each of these categories, you've got library-dependent versus independent methods. And within, say, the library-dependent methods, you've got methods such as um, AIA, antibiotic resistance analysis, and carbon utilization, which is uh, biotyping of, of microorganisms. And here under phenotypic method that is library independent would be would be um, a method like FOGE typing. And FOGE is, um, in case you don't know, our, our viruses that infect bacteria. And there are some FOGEs that are more commonly present in um, animals versus humans. Um, it's a very uh, easy method to do, inexpensive. Uh, there's not a lot of FOGE types, but still, uh, that's probably why there I put it under library independent methods. Okay, and then you've got genotypic methods, same things. You've got same have the two categories. And you've got PCR, which actually can be um, used for either library dependent or independent methods. And then you've also got um, sequencing. Um, PCR is used to look for host-specific markers. And then um, your library dependent uh, may want to use PFGE, which I'll explain later. Okay, first uh, I want to talk about phenotypic methods. And um, the definition of phenotype is an, is an observable physical or bio chemical characteristic of an organism. Um, and this can vary depending on, you know, some environmental factors. So um, what do I mean by some of the physical traits of organisms? Well, shown here is um, actually these are uh, colonies that are pigmented. Um, they're fecal forms, and you can see that you've got some colonies that are purple in color versus these colonies here that are clear. Um, Beckman is actually helpful in discriminating and identifying certain bacteria. Um, and I'll explain this a little bit later. We also look at the morphology. Um, you know, what does the colony look like on the agar plate? Another key phenotypic test that we use is um, we actually look at whether the bacteria are mobile or not. Uh, people don't realize that bacteria are actually capable of moving in water. They can swim. And so this is a neat little test that we can do in the lab to determine whether or not they're modal. And basically what we do is we'll take a colony from a plate onto a um, a needle, and we'll just um, stab it into the semi-solid auger. And um, 24 hours later, after the, the organisms have incubated, we look to see whether they've moved away from the stab line, which in this case you can see, um, you know, the media is clear, and there's some growth there on the stab line. But here, um, you've got, you know, organisms that are growing throughout the uh, the need, which is a positive test for motility. So this is another test that's helpful in identifying bacteria. We also look at um, carbonization, um, and this is simply, you know, what types of carbohydrates or sugars do the bacteria use and um, mobilize for food? So if you've ever wondered, you know, how are bacteria identified to species and genus le level, um, these are just a few of the tests that are used in the clinical laboratory. I want to talk more about carbon utilization because this is still being used um, in MSC studies. Um, it's 
been, you know, for many years by hospital labs to identify bacteria. Um, it's a, it's a culture-based biotyping method. Um, you have to remember that um, these tests are not always 100% accurate for all bacteria, um, especially when you're using tests that were designed to identify bacteria in the clinical laboratory and using it for bacteria in the environment. They may not work as well. Um, the fear of this method is that it's very easy to perform um, and it's relatively inexpensive. Here I'm showing um, there's two ways you can do carbonization testing. You can use um, automated systems. And um, shown here is the Vitec, which is commonly used in wastewater laboratories to identify bacteria. Um, some other automated systems include the BioLog, MicroScan. And basically, what these machines do is um, similar to what we do um, manually, but um, they can do many more samples at one time and, and um, test for, for many more tests. For, for example, um, what you see here is an API strip, and this is a test that can be done manually. Basically, what you do is you grow up the organism, um, and you make a suspension, and you inoculate this tube. And each of these individual tubes is a different test um, for an enzyme, or it could be for, you know, the carbohydrate that the bacteria uses. Here you see some that are in yellow, which is a positive test, versus these red ones that are negative tests. And so by looking at, you know, what types of enzymes and carbohydrates bacteria use, we can come up with an identification. What's nice about these automated methods is that this is a Vitec card, and each of these wells represents a different test. Um, so you can see that, you know, with automated systems, you can do, you know, 50 or more tests compared to manual methods where you may have, you know, a panel of maybe 20 tests. But the thing about these manual methods are that they're simple to use and relatively inexpensive. Okay, so um, that was one category of MST methods. Now I'm going to talk about um, genotypic methods. And um, so these have to do with the genotype or the genetic makeup of organisms. Um, the great about genotypic methods compared to phenotypic methods is that uh, they allow for a higher level level of discrimination. And this is in the majority of cases compared to phenotypic methods. Um, there is a equipment cost that's required up front um, to purchase, you know, your thermocyclers and your computers and the software, et cetera. Um, but the uh, sample cost is is much low, much lower. And phenotypic tests, and um, you can do up to you know 96 tests in one run. So those are some of the advantages of genotypic methods. Um, and what most people do are doing now with MSP methods is using real-time PCR, which is even faster than traditional PCR. And uh, since just the expert on uh, real-time PCR. Here. I think I'll let him talk, talk about that right now. Okay. So with, with real-time PCR, this is also known as quantitative PCR. Uh, the difference is that in addition to having primers uh, amplify a specific stretch of gene that you're interested in, you also have a reporter probe that binds to that product that you're producing. And over time, this probe is fluorescent, and so as the amount of product grows in your PCR and your, your, your and the number of amplicons grows, and this, this probe binds to it, it produces additional fluorescence, and so you get a linear response. And once there's enough fluorescence, um, we call that the CT value, to actually be detected by the 
the um, optical unit in the thermocycler, then um, we are to extrapolate that number back to the original starting number of gene copies. So, and that is related to the bacteria that are, are there. So, so, the specific probes you're using. Okay. So, I'll pass back to Donna. So, basically, what um, Don was saying is that with real-time PCR, we don't have to wait until the PCR run is complete before we get a product. We can actually um, see on the computer monitor um, what's happening in real time so we can see the DNA being amplified. And um, so this method is, uh, I don't would you say it cuts down the time by about half compared to? No, much less because you don't have to actually look for the product and run it out on the shelf. So significantly faster. Under, under an hour in some cases. Okay. I don't know if you all heard that, but John said um, under an hour in cases. Okay, um, so I want to talk about the difference between library independent versus dependent methods. Um, you know, when mobile source tracking first came on the scene, a lot of people were doing library independent methods. Um, and with, we've learned that there are quite a few uh, patients with library independent methods. But people are still using these methods. And in some cases, um, you may want to use a library independent method. So I'm going to talk about the differences. Basically, with a library independent method, um, you're comparing the um, phenotypic or genotypic characteristic of your organism in your sample, say, to um, the, the genetic marker or um, I'm starting with library dependent. The organism is matched to the genetic or phenotypic traits in your reference your reference database. Um, and I'll show you an example in a minute of what the library looks like. Whereas with library independent methods, um, you don't have to build a database. You're simply looking for a specific genetic marker to indicate the source. So the nice thing about the independent methods is that they don't require the database, which is a lot of work. You'll see in a minute. So what a um, library looks like. Um, here you see the different sources that um, you know you're interested in, and this is actually data that um, got from looking at ARA about. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, and we were interested in knowing so what percentage of the bacteria in this case it was Enterococcus coming from cats versus dogs, etc. And so what we did was um, we built a, a database which acquired going out and collecting fecal samples from these animals. Here you see in parentheses the number of fecal samples that were collected per source. And um, in this case, we were using antibiotic resistance analysis. And basically what this is, is looking at the resistance patterns of organisms to a variety of different antibiotics, you know, like ampicillin, tetracycline, et cetera. And you compare the patterns of what you find in an from cats um, to the pens that you've determined from um, the sorry from your sample to those of your database, and basically what you can see here is that um, so there were 13 isolates or individual bacterial strains from cats that were correctly identified or categorized as um, you know, cat people waste. Um, but then you got other strains that were misclassified um, as being, you know, strains more similar to those in dogs, horses, etc. Um, it's not surprising here that you would find some of these 
so it's categorized uh, as humans because um, you know humans and cats um, live in close proximity. So some sharing of bacteria going on. on. This is a library looks like. And so if you're interested in knowing the specific source, whether it's seagulls, um, humans, or sewage, um, you'll have to use a library method versus an independent method. So um, I could go into the library construction a lot. That could be a whole other talk. But I just want to um, emphasize the fact that when you're developing a database, you've got to think about what are the fecal sources that are representative of my watershed. You're going to have to decide on what variety of birds and animals you want to include, and also how many stool samples and isolates per stool sample are representative. Uh, one thing you don't want is a small library because then you'll, you'll end up with a higher misclassification rate. Um, and then also you're going to need to validate the library. Um, and this is done, as I showed previously, by taking some samples from specific source animals and um, comparing them with your, here, let me go back. So look at the rates of, of correct classification and determine, you know, how well does your library work? Um, you can see in this case, um, we had some human isolates that weren't categorized as humans. Most of them were um, categorized as cats. And then had a few um, that were categorized as coming from dogs. You can see where there's problems with misclassification um, using the library method. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to, to talk about some of the commonly used methods. I'm really interested in knowing. So, you know, um, given that the field has been around for the last 10 years, what have you learned about, about you know, how reliable these methods are and what are most people using? Um, and here's a list of library independent methods, which includes the Bacteroides PCR. Um, the now methods that are specific for human, um, ruminant, swine, horses. Um, there are people that are working on um, markers for ducks and, and other types of birds. Um, and then we have the E. coli toxin gene. As you know, E. coli can be found in, in humans, different animals. And what um, this test does is it looks specifically for um, Gene. This is the gene um, that's activated that uh, allows the organism to cause diarrhea. And so there's actually tests that are specific for these different source categories. Another that you might have heard about is the intercoxy um, ESPE or sur surface protein method um, that was ordered to be specific for humans. Um, <clears throat> We've certainly learned that it's not as specific as um, you know we hope. Um, the, the paper that came out, I think, a couple of years ago, showing that ESP um, anacoxy can be found um, in the natural environment and from non-human sources. Um, other methods that are still being commonly used include the human adenovirus PCR, enovirus PCR, and F plus RNA collage. Okay, um, probably the most common human marker that method that's being used now is the human bacteroides HF183. There's been several publications that have com come out recently um, that have shown that this marker is very specific to human waste. Okay, um, and I'm saying, some people are still using ARA, even though it was shown to um, have problems for large, complex watersheds. Um, it actually may work well, work well in smaller watersheds where you know, may have just a few sources um, that are contributing, such as you know, cattle, 
Um, here I'm showing, you know, uh, a plate of, uh, I'm sure what my micro, oh, aureus. And what we do is we grow the bacteria on, on um, media, and we apply these discs to have different types and levels of antibiotics. And we get it over and over, and we basically look for zones of inhibition around the antibiotic disc. Um, here you can see uh, there's no zone of inhibition around this particular antibiotic, which means that the organism is resistant to that antibiotic, whereas here you can see that it's susceptible. And so um, we can actually come up with patterns for different bacterial strains using ARA. Some other laboratory-dependent methods are communalization, um, PCR, and PFGE. Okay, here, um, PFGE is pulse field gel paresis, and I'm showing um, some of the equipment that's required. Um, like PCR, it's expensive up front to purchase the equipment. Um, I think the computer and the software and the equipment is going to run you around twenty to twenty-five thousand um, dollars. PFGE is a DNA typing method. It's probably um, one of the more common library um, methods that's still being used. Um, it's going to be reliable. It's used by CDC and public health labs to track disease outbreaks um, that you've heard about with Salmonella. Um, coli 0157. Um, the downside of PFG is that it's labor intensive and expensive. Okay, um, now I want to mention some of the new methods. Um, some of these methods, such as the human polymavirus PCR, um, is used in the epi studies conducted here at SQUIRP. Human uh, polymavirus is shed in human urine. So if you get a positive result, um, you know, the uncertainty is whether that's because there are swimmers in your beach that were, you know, urinating versus was it um, because of human fecal waste. Um, this is Catalacus mammalian PCR. Um, this organism was found to be um, Specific for uh, water uh, developed by some folks up at UC Davis a few years ago. Um, looks promising, hasn't been widely tested, so um, not sure about how specific it is for birds at this time. Another method um, that's being used is community analysis. Um, this is more of a research method, um, so it's not a mature method that is ready for standardization just yet. Um, the disadvantage is that it requires hundreds of sequences to um, profile a community. And that's basically what you're doing is instead of looking at an individual bacteria, um, this method involves looking at the whole population and what different species and strains um, comprise a bacterial community. So this would be a great tool for comparing, say, a community of bacteria and sewage to um, what you're seeing at a particular problem site. And, um, in addition to selecting the meth type, you're going to have to decide on which organism you want to target. So he listed um, E. coli and enterococci. Um, with E. coli, we felt that it really didn't work well for library methods um, because there's such high genetic diversity of this organism that, organism that um, you may not be able to capture, you know, all of the strains in your library. You know, in fact, in a single individual, um, you may have hundreds of different strains. So E. coli is a problem. It's a promiscuous organism. Um, so that means is, you know, um, it um, changes in genetic composition very rapidly due to things like um, plasmids and recombination. You may want to focus on enterococcus. Um, the thing you want to know about enterococcus is that 
um, may need to do some phenotypic testing because there's some species that are so closely related um, that they differ by just uh, one or two base pairs. And so if you're using genetic methods, you may not be able to distinguish those species. Okay. So then there's E. coli toxin gene, and as I mentioned, the ESP gene. And um, some problems with these methods are that, like um, most human pathogens, they may be low in, in prevalence. Okay, there's human viruses, um, which may also be low in prevalence, although Human viruses, on the whole, will be more specific to humans than most bacteria, so that would be an advantage to including a virus method. Um, and then bacteroides, we mentioned before. These organisms are actually more prevalent in the gastrointestinal tract than your E. coli and enterococci. Um, so, you know, they're probably a better indicator for that reason, and also because they're obligate anaerobes, which means they don't tolerate oxygen very well, they're not likely to grow in environment. So this shouldn't be a problem in terms of uh, bacterial regrowth. So mention here um, chemical markers that could be used to supplement these other microbial methods. Um, they're inexpensive. Uh, they have some issue with limited specificity. I'm not going to talk about these today, um, but there's a reference um, that I've listed that talks specifically about optical brightener, brighteners. As for future uh, microbial source tracking methods, what you're going to see is um, increased development and use of the host-specific methods and um, rapid methods that will be able to do that for you. All right, get into data interpretation. Um, and this is important to understand what the limitations are uh, and assumptions so that you can make sense of the results that you get. Um, so the assumption with using microbial source tracking methods is that there is host specificity. In other words, your um, human bacteroides is going to be specific to humans and not um, to birds, etc. The limitation is that we can't really achieve 100% specificity um, because um, there's strain sharing, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, between, say, humans and dogs. And, um, also, it's impossible to determine whether organisms are 100% specific without going out testing um, bacteria from every single source on the planet. Um, another assumption is that these microbial populations are stable geographically and temporally, and we know that um, they, in, the, in fact, may be unstable. They may over time. Change, and they may be different um, based on geographic location. Okay, and the third assumption is that the species in the environment or in your library represent the host animal that's responsible for fecal contamination. And we know that, in fact, the location is that the species detected may not be the cause of fecal contamination. Okay, um, I also want to emphasize that you need to interpret data costly. Some of the MST methods are still considered research tools. The thing is you need to look at the results and ask yourself, um, do they make sense? Um, do they correlate with the FIB results, um, with the observable data? Um, if you're getting samples that are, you know, 75, 90 percent positive, it may be that you've got a contamination issue. So um, you've got to determine whether the results are false positives, or in the case where you get non-detection of um, human markers or particular animal markers, it because um, you've got some false negatives. So false positives are when the target is detected, uh, when the 
the is detected based on the test, but it's actually not present. Um, and this can occur because of low specificity, contamination between cells, and um, cross activity with non targets. And so what this means is that you may have a target that is similar to an, another organism in the environment. And so it's testing positive for this other organism um, is very similar to the one that you're looking for. I mentioned you may have an issue with false negatives, and this is where um, you're not detecting your target. And this can occur with molecular methods um, because of inhibition. You may have enzymes present in your sample that inhibit or interfere with the test. Another um, issue is low sensitivity. It may be that you didn't collect enough of the sample. You know, instead of 100 mLs, you may need 500 or a liter. Um, and then there's also the issue of DNA extraction and whether you had sufficient DNA material. Okay, another thing you'll need to um, do is to consider the results of the validation samples. Um, what I mean is that um, you need to keep in mind that you know you may have a sewage sample that could test positive for bird markers, and and this makes sense because we know that birds congregate at you know the wastewater treatment plants and they're you know defecating in streams and creeks. Uh, another thing is you're going to need to uh, correlate the results between methods. And this can be a little tricky because you may have two different methods that um, agree, but they may, the answer may not be correct. For example, um, with uh, using, using ARA and ribotyping for E. coli, and 16% 16 of the results agreed. They, you know, with both methods, they indicated that 16% of the isolate, isolates were human-derived, um, when in fact, even though the results agree, it may be that only 6% were actually from humans. And so that's another thing you need to, to look at. Um, not only how well do the methods correlate, but how accurate were they. Now, um, this is the chart. Everybody likes pie charts. Um, this is what you get when you use a library method. Um, and this is an example showing that 25% of your isolates, uh, whether they're E. coli or intercoxy, were human-derived. 35% um, um, were allocated to birds, 5% to cattle, and 35% to an unknown category. It's um, important to keep in mind that these are relative estimates, that source inputs vary, um, numbers will change, you know, and just represent um, the percentages that were found at the time when you collected your sample, basically. Um, and in terms of 25%, um, you know, indicated to human, well, this could indicate sewage, but it could also in indicate um, contamination from swimmers or homeless people. Um, and in terms of um, allocation to birds and cattle, you have to keep in mind that um, the streams that are in these animals will vary depending on diet. And so um, back to the high chart, you, you see here there's 35% that were unknown. So what about those unknown sources? Maybe that um, these represent sources that were not included in the library. On the other hand, um, they may represent bacterial strains that are naturally occurring. Um, and these be adapted strains. We really don't know um, at this point whether naturally occurring uh, fecal uh, indicator bacteria are there because they originated from fecal waste or if, you know, they were just always there, and maybe they actually originated from sediments and adapted to humans. That's something we can't determine yet using genetic methods. Um, some other sources that could be included in this unidentified category are um, 
bacteria from natural bacteria from sediments, plants. Um, and to remember that, that natural sources can serve as reservoirs uh, for uh, fecal indicator bacteria. So if you've done an MST study and you've implicated, you've implicated, I'm sorry, you've implemented um, best management practices and, you know, you've done everything possible to control human sources and you still have a problem with exceeding water quality standards, then you may want to do um, six of studies focused on looking at, at natural sources. Okay, other issues I'll just mention quickly um, that we don't know um, and that could interfere or complicate data interpretation is um, we don't know a whole lot still about the prevalence and survival of target organisms in the environment, um, such as bacteroides. Um, we know that organisms vary in survival rates. Um, for instance, enterococci, um, the survival is more closely related to those of viruses compared to total and fecal coliforms, which don't serve as long. Um, talked about low specificity due to cosmopolitan organisms, sharing of organisms. And then there are transient strains. So, you know, um, you could get a uh, result um, based on strains that are just temporary residents rather than um, uh, residents that are more long-term, and that would be more specific of a host. So those are to keep in mind when you're inputting the data. Okay, so now um, I'm going to talk about some recommendations. And because there's all of these issues surrounding MST methods with, you know, limitations and the fact that we still don't have a single method that, that um, is 100% reliable or that can sufficiently identify all sources, is that you have to use a toolbox approach, which means using more than one MST method to increase the sensitivity and reliability of your results. This will also help you to prioritize sources. All right, people always ask, so how much do these methods cost? And here what I'm showing is just the relative cost between the methods, with live methods being the most expensive. Um, you get specific methods are, are less expensive. And of course, all of this depends on the number of samples that you're going to test. So in all of these, um, know, issues, um, I would recommend starting with the least expensive method first to get an idea of what the dominant sources are, and then use more expensive methods such as, um, you know, the lay methods or DNA sequencing, say, to support the findings based on these um, less expensive methods. Another thing you can do is if you don't have a lot of funding um, to archive your samples for when you do have the resources or for, you know, the future when there are other methods that come available that you might want to test with. So what you can do is to actually filter the water and freeze the filter minus 80 degrees for DNA testing later. Um, and then use laboratories that are experienced in MST methods. Um, make sure they're following standardized operating procedures. Um, and you want to validate um, the lab and the methods prior to using them. Um, so this will involve including positive and negative controls. Um, send the lab replicate samples and see how they do with those. Um, and if possible, do split testing between laboratories or with samples. So in summary, there is no single perfect MST method. All methods have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, some methods are still considered research. Um, 
you want to apply a toolbox approach and interpret the results cautiously. Um, the MST method should be used to support other lines of ev evidence, so that includes um, you know, your observable data. Here are some of the references that I mentioned. Uh, EPA actually has a microbial source tracking guidance document. Um, it came out in 2005. It's a, it's a great to start, but um, since 2005, there's been some changes, so there's actually some things in there that are a little bit outdated. Um, here are some other references. And this is a great one for statistics, which I didn't talk about today. This is Rachel's paper um, that was done um, with John Griffith. Um, this is an excellent example of the use of um, different methods to identify sources of pollution in Santa Monica Bay. Um, okay. And um, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm, I'm writing a chapter for a source tracking book. Um, this is going to be available in 2011, and this is the title, Mi Microbial Source Tracking. Um, and the editors are Chuck Hagedorn and Joe Harwood and Anisette Blanche. So be looking for that in 2001. And great reference because um, it'll have, have you know, case studies of um, MST uh, that's been done all over the world, and um, some of the internet, uh, some of the authors are um, from other than the U.S. So, should, so this should be a, a, a great reference to look forward to. to.